Alrighty, we're going to be showing off this Moonman A1, or as we have to call him now, Mahjong. Thanks, Koika. And the A1 is a Vanishing Point clone. I opted for the Clipless version, mainly because I had a few Vanishing Points before and I really did not like to clip up by the, um, the nib point. The clipless version is a little different. It um, obviously doesn't have the clip, but it also adds in a roll stopper. And in the middle, it's not flush with two rings, but instead you have a little drop down to this little thin part here. Kind of a nice little textured band. And of course you got the Moon Man logo on the underside. The roll stopper lines up with the top of the nib. So you can pretty much know where the uh, top is without having a clip there. And then of course we got a nice solid construction, which I was not expecting from a cheaper clone. Almost identical in terms of the vanishing point. The nib's a little different, but the actual construction seems nearly identical. You know, same cartridge protector and so forth. You got that, you know, same little Bring to it. Let me put this in. Right now it might be engaged. There we go. And click. I put this by the microphone so you can hear it. And this one did not come with any packaging or anything like that. Instead, let me see if I can grab it here. It came with two empty cartridges. The spare one has a rubber stopper on it. Um, pretty much make it portable. I kind of like that touch. And a little converter. Um, I tried putting these in a um, pilot cocoon out. And they do fit, but it's a little tight. It won't quite get up to the full height of it, and I can see that through the uh, Kakuno's clear section. Uh, regardless, it's kind of a nice touch. <laughs> All right. Now, the nib on this came pretty decent already. There was a minor misalignment that I had to correct, um, which can be kind of tricky on such a tiny little nib. And then I did a tiny bit of tuning afterwards. It's been inked for a few days with um, some Iroshizuku Shiro. One thing I notice is every time I have this clicker engaged and leave it there and I come back up, there's a little bit of oil that shows up on the, um, the clicker. Kind of wipe that off. I'm assuming eventually it'll stop doing that. I kind of give it a little test here. The Moon Man A1. Got a steel. Extra fine. Now, this is a western size of an extra fine, so it's not going to be nearly as thin as the Japanese EF that you might have been expecting. So it's not comparable directly to the pilot as far as nip sizes go. And the ink on this is Iroshizuku and completely forgot the zoo. Shiro. Which if I remember correctly is the uh, dew on pine tree. Kind of gives it that soft minty look. Very good wet flow here. And very consistent in all directions. Of course, that's more likely the response of my tune in it. Very consistent. And also got the back side working good too. There's a uh, still kind of on the wet side, but a much thinner line. Been very useful today and filling out some vendor logs, especially with the cheaper paper.
So it's nice to have the option to go back and forth. Not a lot of manufacturers do the both sides anymore. Actually have, just to kind of go off topic for a second. And we'll stop. Let's see, where is it? Is it? Yeah, there it is. Getting into my pen tray here. Back in the 1930s, when Schaefer did a uh, sub-brand called the Wasp, which is W.A. Schaefer Pen, they're actually put on this number seven nib up here, writes both ways. Because straight from the manufacturer, it was intended to be written this way, but you could flip it over for a different point. And sometimes that would either be a finer point or it would be cursive italic, uh, or you go from like broad to extra fine, or you go medium to an italic fine, something like that. So I'd like to see more of that in modern pens. Anywho, continuing on. Do the usual alphabet. I kind of have my own little sloppy handwriting that I, I do quickly. But, you know, that's kind of important because we don't always write very slow, especially in day-to-day -day stuff like jotting down notes and stuff like that. So making sure it doesn't skip away when you're try, trying to write a regular pace is important. But like I said, that could be a lot neater. But it wouldn't be much of a good test if I slowed down. Check in the camera, make sure you can see all this. Yep. And then you do the usual little loop to loops. Hmm. It's pretty nice so far. I'm not seeing any wiggles. Got good clearance on there. I've actually been walking this out into the cold. Uh, right now it's about just around 12 degrees Fahrenheit, which is. How oh, would we just sell CSB of that? Probably about negative 15 ish. <laughs> Anywho, um, it come in from the cold, then I go into the store, and then I cook away with it. Um, no burping from any kind of warm ups, and accidentally had to sit in my shirt pocket, nip down while I was in one of the stores doing some merchandising work. and. Did not have any mishaps, so it seems to handle a small amount of jostling. I haven't had any kind of accidents with it yet in the last couple of days, but I guess we'll see in about a week or so. Uh, one of the things I noticed with the wall stopper is that if I look sideways on it, I can see the points where it kind of rivets into the pen. So as if I turn it just slightly, I can see kind of an air gap between the roll stopper and the base of the pen. But it doesn't have any give or wiggles or movements. You know, I can't seem to really pull it up or anything like that. Hmm. So, yeah, that's the Wingman A1 so far. It's got a nice weight to it. It feels solid. It feels pretty much like the vanishing point did as far as my memory and recollection of it. I don't really get any sharp edges, you know, the edges of the wall stoppers are a tiny bit sharp, but it's not enough to bother me. And just handling it in my bag, case, shirt pocket, I um, actually had it next to a screwdriver for a short period of time and hasn't really seemed to nick it at all, so the paint quality is kind of decent on that. For comparison sakes, and for a little show and tell, and show off some of the ventures which I have inked. Um, regarding, I'd 
sometimes call a click or a pocket pen because it's kind of intended to just kind of grab and click and go and so forth. But you don't quite normally get a pocket pen quite as small as this though. This is a little wall 214AW. Uh, they didn't actually have like model numbers per se. They based everything off of the length of, length of the pen. And then the second number was the nib size. Although they didn't call the zero nib a zero, they just said one. And then four would be the pattern, in this case, checkered board. And A for gold fill, and then a W for the ring top. So like one of my other little pen is a four inches long, but it has a number three nib and has the dart pattern, so it's a one, and then gold filled A, but they don't say anything specifically for the clip usually, unless it's the hard rubber pens. Uh, this little guy, gonna show him off real quick. Then we got a wall two one four a w this has a 14 carat number zero nib it's got a tiny little bit of flex to it and the ink in this one is r and k gabiosa assuming i even said that correctly it's a nice wet little pen and a minor amount of flex there and I think this one I could do the back side too. It's like a very fine, fair bit finer than the other. It's almost a needle point on the back side. And cap that off. On the old metal pens, I like to restore them with a little PVC sack um, because the PVC is not going to hurt metal or ebonite. It's mainly just going to hurt celluloid and early plastic. Hmm. Yeah, this is the hard rubber that the manifold came from. I actually got this one to complement the um, shade green one that I had. This one has a little number two that came from one of my other metal pen as a I guess you can call it a semi flick needle point but I'm leaning more towards an extra fine now. This is a wall. The material is called rosewood. It's just basically a mottled red and black hard, rip, um, hard rubber. It's a 14 carat. Um, I am leaning an extra fine, but it's closer to an extra, extra fine. And this is Waterman Inspired Blue. I don't know why they changed it from the name of, um, uh, what was it, South Seas Blue? And it kind of sound nicer, kind of like you're out in the tropics. Hmm. And do a little light hand. I don't exactly have the calligrapher's touch when it comes to going light-handed. Uh, what's the battery still good? And of course you got this nice big old Schaefer oversized balance. Got this up in a uh, antique mall. I was really surprised to see it. Even more surprised when I can get it under fifty dollars. The only downside is it's got uh, an engraving as T English with a little flourish down there. It's hardly noticeable though. But when I um, redid the the sack, I put the um, lever lined up with the uh, nib. And uh, comparatively speaking, it is a nice big nib. And this one, let's see, is it? This one has a little bit of a habit of getting a tiny bit of grain ink right on the lip. If 
aside from the condensation. It's not bad though. But sometimes I'll get like a little mark on my finger, but yeah, kind of a rite of passage. Let me safer. Go with balance. This is sort of a semi flux too. It's a 14 carat lifetime. I'm leaning probably an extra fine on this. This is a Montblanc Irish Green. One of my favorite green inks. Uh, what else do I got inked? I will show off some stuff for early video since I don't normally do video recordings like this. Uh, I do have a Mont Blanc 14 here. Yeah, nice little spot. This is uh, from the 1960s. Because I was really saddened when it developed a hairline crack right there in the bottom. And the reason it did that, did that is because the nip unit is inside of a collar and then that collar comes up inside and the thing that stopped the nib from coming out the front is a little notch inside the grip. And as the stress is pushed on that notch, it can develop a little crack right there. Um, I haven't purchased a replacement grip yet, but what I did do was with a sewing needle, I put a tiny amount of super glue and kind of rubbed it around the spot of the crack. And when that got a little tacky and firmer, I kind of got it pressed in using a small flat metal piece and then let that cure for a couple of days. And then as it cured, I would kind of polish it down and smooth it, but I didn't want to smooth it completely flat just in case it's kind of capping off that crack. But this is probably one of my favorite pens that I've used for quite some time. I see where I am on the camera. Yep, there you go. Look at that. Blah, blah. Fourteen, and this has uh, 18 carat, I'm going to say in the realm of extra fine on this. And right now, it is a Waterman Mysterious Blue. The real mystery is, wasn't this color have some sort of a teal or a blue green to it? in previous generation. I keep hearing that, but I've only ever seen it as sort of a blue-black, kind of a very traditional blue-black, not quite teal leaning. This one could do the backside too, although the backside kind of scratchy on this one. But because the front side is so decent, I didn't want to risk messing it up with some tuning. Especially since it's not like I can easily get this again. Wasn't that expensive though, but finding another one seems to be more expensive than I want to deal with. Oh, and little shout out to the Pandemic with Boost. He makes these little pen pillows. And this one's kind of a nice little shiny thing. It's um, polymer clay, I think, is what he said it was. And I had uh, another one here. Hmm. They're not bad. Hmm. Kind of cute. 